terms of introduction, did you know that there's one character from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, only one character that is specifically called a friend of God? You know who that character was? Abraham, exactly right. In the, the book of James chapter 2, verse 23, the Bible says that Abraham was a friend of God. Did you know that in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7, that the Bible refers to Abraham as being a friend of God? But here in this text, we find that Jesus Christ says that He is going to lay down His life for His friends. Today, I want to preach about this thought, I am a friend of God. Today, I submit to you that I am a friend of God. Because Jesus Christ looked out into uh, this time when He was in eternity and decided that He was going to come to this earth to live a perfect, sinless life to die for my sins on the cross. Now, before we proceed into this text, you need to understand that the setting of John chapter 15, this might make sense to you after I say it a couple times, but the setting of John 15 is found in John 13. Let me say that again so it can sink in. The setting of John chapter 15 is found in John chapter 13. Keep in mind that when the Bible was originally written, that is, when the John the Apostle was receiving the inspired words of God as he was at his desk at his table with the writing utensils and he was writing down the words of God, there were no chapter divisions and there were no verses. So when you had this manuscript, it was a long letter and a pretty long letter. Now, I don't know if you've ever wrote a letter before, but I'm pretty sure you never wrote a letter this long. And here we find that, that sometimes chapters overlap. And the setting, we go back to John chapter 3 and we find the Lord's, uh, the Last Supper. And Jesus is speaking with His disciples. And He talks about how there's one here who's going to betray me. And that one named Judas gets up and leaves. And then in John chapter 13, verse 31, the Bible says that after Judas leaves, Jesus Christ began to speak these words. And He goes and He speaks the rest of John 13 to them. And He goes in John 14 and He speaks John 14, verses 1 through 31 to them, uh, to the disciples, the 11 disciples. And then in John chapter 15, we find the same context that Jesus is standing at the place where they had the Last Supper that we are going to recall today. And he's speaking to them. And here in this passage, I believe that the key verse in the entire chapter is verse 13. You can disagree with me all you want to, but when we get to heaven, we'll find out that was the truth. Uh, but it says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I have a question for us today. How do we know we're a friend of God. Abraham was labeled as a friend of God, but he's the only one specifically named in Scripture. To my knowledge, if I'm incorrect, please let me know. And then in this text, we find that he calls his disciples his friends. Also, Jesus, alive on this earth, when Judas was betraying him in the garden, he calls him friend. So it's interesting that the one that betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus called friend. And he says, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Today, I'd like to present you just briefly three attributes of a friend of God. I believe that in verses 1 through 8 and also over in verse 16, we're going to discover this. A friend of God will make disciples for God. Then in verses 9 through 15, we'll discover the second attribute. A friend of God will be obedient to God. And then verses 17 all the way down through verse 27, we'll discover the third attribute is this. A friend of God, you may not like this one, so take note of it. A friend of God will be persecuted for God. Will you come with me as we journey through this text? We find that throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the door. He says, I am the good shepherd. He says, I am the way. He says, I am the truth. He says, I am the life. He says here in this text, I am the true vine. This is the last of the great I am's in Scripture that we find. And he says, I am the true vine in verse number one, and my father is the husbandman. The people of Israel understood what it was like to have a vineyard. They grew grapes, and they made a juice, and they made 
all the different things that, that you can use for grapes. And we find that, that here in this text that Jesus Christ is using the vineyard scene and a vine as an analogy. And he says, every branch in me that bears not fruit he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. Notice his words, for without me... You can do nothing. Would you say that with me? For without me, you can do nothing. A friend of God will make disciples for God. Now, I want you to know that here when it's talking about fruit, you know that, that the, the husbandman's going to go in the vineyard, and if, if there's a vine that's not producing any more uh, grapes, that is going to get plucked off. It's going to be taken out. And here, Jesus is just relaying that, that there's a simple truth that, that those who are Christians, those who are believers, are going to reproduce themselves and make disciples. And I want you to notice in verse 5, without God, discipleship is impossible. Without God, discipleship is impossible. For some reason, in the 20th century, we have traded evangelism for discipleship. Now listen, I am all for evangelism, but evangelism is only a part of the Great Commission. You see, the Great Commission, as revealed in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts, it is making disciples, and that consists of going out and evangelizing the world, declaring and sharing the Gospel of Jesus Christ. It means to, to, not, to, to evangelize them, get them converted. Jesus Christ does all that stuff, you see. But then He commands us to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when somebody is baptized, they're baptized within a body of believers. It's best to do that. But when they're baptized, they're making a public profession of their faith and saying, hey, I'm a child of the, of the risen Jesus Christ, King of Kings, and I'm seeking to live my life in obedience to His commands. That's what it means when you're being baptized. It's not means that you're going to, that baptism is a requirement of salvation, it's a result of salvation. So evangelism, baptism, and then to teach them. That is, to train, to take God's Word. Uh, my duty, in a sense, is to, to train the congregation in the Word of the living God. And yes, there's going to be times that, that I may not be in full agreement with you, and you may not be in full agreement with me, okay? But when we look at the articles of our faith and our church, we, we can agree on some of these things, and we need to move on with those. So we are to train people in the Word of God, and then we are to teach them to do likewise. So they, in turn, when you get to know Christ as Savior, you're baptized, you're trained in the Word. You, you get to know God by studying His Word and listening to the preaching and teaching Sunday school class. And if you're not involved in the Sunday school class, may God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you. And may He put it on your heart and mind to be here at Sunday school. Um, and nonetheless, we find that, that you do these things and then you're to go out into the world and reproduce yourself just as somebody reproduced themselves in you. So without God, discipleship is impossible. So, we have a church. This church is to fulfill the Great Commission. We go and evangelize the community. We baptize the converts. We train them. And then we send them out. So, you may be sent out of our churches to go and evangelize our community, but there will come a time when somebody feels the call of God in their life to, to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be a church planner, to do all these different things, a missionary, and it is our duty to send them out into the world so they can go and do likewise. Amen. Churches are to birth churches, just like believers are to birth believers. Now, I want you to notice in verse number 6, it says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, time doesn't allow me to get into the details of this, but there are three specific views and interpretations of this verse. One is, the burned branches represents Christians who've lost their salvation, which I don't believe that. I believe that would be inconsistent with the, the New Testament and the Word of God. But And then there's another view. It says, the burned branches are Christians who 
will lose rewards, but not salvation at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15 does indicate that there is a possibility that a believer can lose reward based upon their lifestyle and the way they live their life here in this earth. But I want you to notice that I tend to lean towards this view. The burned branches refer to professing Christians who, like Judas, are not genuinely saved and therefore judged. One commentator said this, This does not refer to everlasting punishment in hell. Note that there are results of not abiding in Christ as a branch. The man himself is not the branch. The branch represents the fruits of his relationship with Christ. Notice these words now. When the Christian faith... Excuse me, when the Christian falls to abide in Christ, he withers, dries up, and his fruit or works will be judged by fire. So there will be some in this verse, I believe, is referring to maybe somebody who's like Judas, who's unsaved. But then this verse could be referring, in verse number 6, as a backslidden Christian who's not reproducing themselves in their community. But I want you to notice, without God, discipleship is impossible. But I need you to understand this, that when making disciples, we will have successes. When making disciples, we will have success. So there will be a time when somebody will be evangelized, baptized, uh, catechized, if you will, and then sent out and mobilized into the world. And they will do it. But you need to know also, when making disciples there will be failures. When making disciples, you will go out into the world and, and somebody will profess to know Christ as Savior. They, they may follow the Lord and believers baptism. They may even be trained in the faith. But eventually, it seems as if they walk away. I'm reminded of that verse in 1 John that they did not continue with us because they were never of us. And as we look at the 12 disciples, you have 11 of them that stayed the course. But one of them chose to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ called all 12 of them friend. So may I ask us all a very sobering question. Which friend are you? Which friend am I? Am I the disciple that's going to stay the course? Or am I the professing disciple who will turn their back on God and betray Jesus Christ? Notice verse number 16. It says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bear forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whosoever ye shall ask, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. And we see in these verses, a friend of God will make disciples for God. But as we move f further through this passage, I need to share with you the second attribute of a friend of God. It's found in verses 9 through 15. A friend of God will be obedient to God. A friend of God will be obedient to God. Notice, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wow, Brian, it seems as if... Jesus is repeating himself, and in a matter of fact, he is. If you go back to John chapter 13, he talks about loving one another. He talks about obeying his commandments, and he does the same thing in John chapter 14, and he's reiterating himself. You know, repetition is said to be the mother of all learning. Somebody once said, repetition is the key to retention. It's okay to repeat yourself every now and then. Jesus Christ does it in John 13, 14, and 15. And we find in these several verses, verse Verses 9 through 15, all he's saying is a friend of God will be obedient to God. Notice verses 9 through 11. These three verses reveal this. <coughs> Those who love God will live by His precepts. Those who love God will live by His precepts. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. Check out verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. At some point in Junius's life, he decided to stop keeping the commandments of God. It says, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So when we look at Jesus Christ, He was obedient to God the Father's will. Go to the cross, die for the sins of humanity. And He did just that. Verse number uh, uh, 11 goes on to say, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Those who are full of joy are those who are abiding and living in obedience 
to God's commands. But let me tell you one thing. I know from experience, when you're not living in obedience to the Word of God, life can get very messy and miserable. And uh, it just seems like that, that nothing is going right, that everything's going wrong. And, and may I say this, I'm not saying that when you're obedient to the commandments of God that everything's going to be picture perfect. But all I'm saying is that your conscience will be clear. And that the conviction of the Holy Spirit will not be heavily burdened upon your shoulders. Those who love God will live by His precepts. But I want you to notice in verses 12 through 15 that uh, how to be obedient to God. Check it out. Those who love God will love other people. I know we shared this a couple weeks ago, but Jesus Christ is making a reiteration again. And, he, and listen, verse 12 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. He said the same thing back in John 13, verse 34. And then he says this, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Verse 14 stands out. It says, Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. A friend of God will be obedient to God. How can you be obedient to God? Well, by keeping and living in his, by His precepts and by loving other people. May God help us to live by His Word and to love each other the way Christ has loved us. But now I want to draw your attention to the last several verses of this passage. Verses 17 all the way down through 27. Now, we need to be reminded, a friend of God will make disciples for God. A friend of God will be obedient to God. But thirdly, a friend of God will be persecuted for God. At some point in our lives, you will be hated, persecuted, despised, rejected, ridiculed, made fun of, scoffed, mocked at, maybe even scourged, maybe even imprisoned, maybe even beaten, maybe even beheaded or killed, all because you named the name of Christ. Here, he says, he goes on the, uh, in, in this passage and he says, um, he says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And he goes on to talk about this, that, that I've chosen you out of the world, and it's because of that that the world is going to hate you. And he says that they hate you because they know not me. So I wrote down this as I was reading through this passage. He's going to summarize all these verses. Persecution is the result of continually rejecting the message of salvation. Now all that means is that those who are doing the persecuting have continually rejected the message found right here. They hate this book and all they want to do is silence your mouth and perhaps sentence you to death. There's people all over the world today that are being persecuted. In China, India, Africa, all over the world. There may come a day here that we'll be persecuted. And in a way, we're being persecuted in different ways. Today it's all about freedom of speech. And our freedom of speech, whether you believe it or not, is rapidly um, being persecuted. And there will probably come a day that me as a minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and if I stand from this pulpit or any other pulpit and say certain things about sin, as the Bible calls it, then somebody may come and try to shut this place down or other places like this. There may come that day. So we need to prepare for that day and to say that, hey, I'm going to still stand for the Word of God no matter what society says about this book. Hey, tough decisions are not made in the heat of the battle. They're made in advance. So it's time, church, 
church that, hey, listen, uh, if that's the way God has for my life, for our lives today, we must say, thy will be done, as Jesus Christ said, and be willing to be persecuted because Jesus Christ was persecuted. When you study the book of Acts, I love studying the book of Acts. We've looked through it. But when the saints of God were persecuted is when the gospel of Jesus Christ burned throughout the world and souls were being saved. And as you look in China, as you look in India, as you look in Africa, you look in other parts of this world, the gospel is being furthered because the saints of God are willing to be persecuted. But today in the United States of America, may I say this please, may I say it today, may I have your attention please, that the reason why the gospel may not be furthered in America is because Christians are not willing to be persecuted for the word of God. Christians are not willing to take a stand for God's word. And may I say, the message of the gospel will be hindered when that happens. Amen. As we come to a close this morning, may I ask us all a very simple question. Are you a friend of God? Jesus said here that the greatest love is the love of sacrifice and of dying for someone. And that's what Jesus Christ did for you and me 2,000 years ago. And if you believe and put you, and if put your faith and trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and accepted His atoning sacrifice for your sin, then you, my dear friend, can be called a friend of God. But I close with a very sobering verse found in James chapter 4. James says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of this world is the enemy of God. Would you rather be a friend of God or the enemy of God? A friend of God will make disciples. A friend of God will be obedient to God. And a friend of God will be persecuted. Father, we thank you.